If you have ever dreamed about moving to Navarre, Florida, this is a video you cannot miss. I'm going to go over the top seven things that you need to know before moving to Navarre, Florida. These things are going to include things like the school system, what tourism looks like while we're out here, the cost of living, and so much more. My goal here is to make you feel as comfortable as possible moving here to Navarre, Florida, or steering you in a different direction in case Navarre isn't right for you. So let's get into it. I'd like to start off this video with some of the popular thing that some of us locals do, and I'm going to be wildly transparent in this entire video, so there's going to be a little bit of the good, bad, and ugly all kind of mixed into this video, so make sure that you stick all the way until the end so that you don't miss out on any of the good stuff or the bad stuff. So I'm going to start off with some of the popular things that us locals like to do. I know tourism is pretty big in Navarre, so we do have a lot of tourists that come in to enjoy our laid-back beach lifestyle, but that's not necessarily what all of us locals do, although you'd be surprised that we do share some commonalities. So first and foremost, the beaches. Listen, we can't have a Life on the Emerald Coast video without discussing these amazing beaches. It's the reason why so many people come here. That powder white sand, emerald green waters, sometimes deep blue waters, depending on what time of year, and you know the temperature and things like that outside, and the sun just glistening off and just bouncing into your eyeballs and just really making you feel like you're in paradise. That is not lost on us locals. Now, I will say that we don't go out to the beach or do the water stuff as often, or at least most of us do not, because, well, we're living and working here, and this is our day-to-day -day as well. But living here does afford you the opportunity to go out to that beach absolutely any freaking time you want, and that is awesome. And of course, since we are talking about Navarre in this video, and we do videos all over from Pensacola to Panama City Beach, but since we're focusing on Navarre in this video, you will be right next to the water at all times. Even if you lived as far north as you possibly can in Navarre, you are not gonna be further than eight minutes away from the beach. That is, of course, eight minutes, assuming there's no traffic, which we'll talk about here in a minute. And of course, when we're talking about a beach town like Navarre, we can't skip the water activities because that's something we do quite often here as well. Whether it's just running a jet ski to go tool around in the sound, or it's to grab a pontoon boat or a fishing boat and go out to Crab Island for the afternoon, or even going out and going fishing, these are all activities that we really enjoy. Of course, you don't need a watercraft to enjoy the water activities. We've also got snorkeling and stand-up paddle boarding and scuba diving and things. We even have artificial reefs that we have purposely buried into the water or I guess sunk in the water. That's right. We have actually sunk boats to create artificial reefs for some of our wildlife. It's good for the wildlife. I know a lot of people look at it and they go, are you guys, are you guys really sinking a boat right now and destroying the ecosystem? No, we're actually helping that ecosystem and it's really good because they've got all of the coordinates so that you can go out there and you can go snorkeling or you can go scuba diving in the area and see the crustaceans and the fish and all of the wildlife that gets surrounded around these artificial reefs. And of course, if you don't want to handle any of this and you just want to maybe enjoy a few drinks or a great dinner, we have sunset cruises, which are a little bit overlooked for us locals because once you do it once or twice, you generally don't keep going back and doing it. At least I don't and I don't know a lot of people that do, but it's still a really good time to do a nice little sunset cruise, three or four hours out on a boat, a beautiful, beautiful meal, some great drinks, and some outstanding company, and not to mention amazing views. But for those of you that don't really want to do any of that, you want to stay on the beach and enjoy the sun, you could go shelling. Shelling is extremely popular here in Navarre. In fact, out of all of the beach towns that we have from Pensacola to Panama City Beach, it's the area we cover. Of course, Florida has more coasts than that. Out of all of the areas, shelling is the most popular right here in Navarre. And it is as simple as it sounds. You're walking the beach looking for shells. You'll see people every single morning, particularly early in the morning, right when the sun is cresting over the ocean. They're walking the beach. They're grabbing shells to take home, to give back to friends, or just to hold on to for a little bit and then toss them back. In fact, the last time I was out at the beach, um, I don't know, maybe a month or so ago, a lady was out doing shelling and she just walked up to me with this beautiful black shell, which I'd never seen a deep black shell like that. And she goes, you know what? I think, I think this one's for you. And just walked off. Like that's the kind of friendliness we have here. But my point of this is shelling is a great activity and you can even lighten up somebody's day by giving them a beautiful shell. 
But if you're one of those folks that you don't necessarily want to be on the beach or in the water, but you do like the look of it, you can sit out at Juana's Pagodas and have a nice, delicious cocktail while listening to some live music or a comedian, whatever they happen to have at the time. Juana's is located right on the Sound, so right when you come over the Navarre Bridge and you're coming back down, that is the first restaurant on the right. So you can sit there and watch all of the people playing beach volleyball or watch the sunset, watch the boats come in. You can actually park your boat right there at Juana's if you'd like to dock up and step on inside. And of course, they've got a great venue there for smaller concerts, which I just went to one about two months ago, and it was a fantastic time. And if you don't want to hang out at Navarre Beach in general, which is where I've been focusing a lot of this locals talk, you could do what a lot of us locals do. Instead of going to these popular tourist areas, a lot of us head out into places like Stripes, which is probably my favorite restaurant slash bar in Navarre. And if you happen to be here on a Wednesday and it happens to be a little bit muggy or something like that, you can pop in there for their trivia night. It is a great time. And lastly, for those that want to completely get away from the crowd and get out in the open and you just kind of want to enjoy the amazing outdoors, you could try the club at Hidden Creek and go, you know, hit a round of golf or two. That's how I golf. I twiddle my fingers and then I, you know, but you can go enjoy a round of golf there. It is a very, very beautiful course. See, all of these things are things that us locals get to do day in and day out because we live here, but that's just one part of the seven part equation that I wanted to talk to you guys about, kind of get you guys a little bit excited about living here if you haven't visited already or if you have visited and you just need a nice reminder of the amazingness that is Nafar. But that's not the only thing we need to talk about in this video, because even though that's all well and good and fun, uh, there are six other topics that I need to make sure that you're aware of before you try to move here to Navarre, Florida. If any of what I just said sounds interesting to you, please consider hitting that subscribe button and dinging that little bell so that you'll be notified every single time I do a new video. We cover topics from Pensacola to Panama City Beach and everything in between, basically the western portion of the Florida panhandle. Okay, let's talk about weather and all things that are around weather. So hurricanes and flooding and all of that stuff, I think is very important before you move to Navarre that you understand a little bit about these. So first we can take a little bit of that fear away, but also so that you're very aware of the overall climate of living here. So first off is flooding. One of the most popular questions I get as a real estate professional that works here in the area is, hey, what is flooding going to be like? Like, is my house going to be in a flood zone? Am I going to be living in a flood zone? What is this all about? So my real estate agent answer is the entire state is in a flood zone technically. And I put the word technically in there for a reason because even though it's all considered in a flood zone because we are a state that touches water, any state in the country that touches water is technically in a flood zone, most of the area of Navarre is in what's called an X flood zone. And an X flood zone means that you do not need any flood insurance. So you are not expecting any floods to happen pending some natural disaster like a hurricane. A hurricane flood and rising water flood are two completely different things in our insurance size. Now, of course, that's my real estate agent answer, but my, you know, hey, you might be moving here answer and realistic answer is flooding can happen, but it's almost always accompanied with a hurricane unless you live directly on the water or on Navarre Beach. Navarre Beach, if a big enough hurricane hits us, can completely get engulfed in water. It has happened before, although it's extremely, extremely rare. It only happens about once every 20 or 30 years, and you're going to have plenty of warning. We'll talk about hurricanes in a second. As far as just natural flooding, just from heavy rain or inclement weather that's not a big hurricane just really hitting our area, it's very unlikely, although there are parts of town that are in flood zones, so you do need to be a little bit careful of that. So if you are moving here, just make sure you work with your real estate professional, if that's not us for any reason. Make sure that you're working with them whenever you're going to show homes, that they're warning you about the different types and the different areas there. So you need a professional that knows Navarre in and out so that they can make sure that you're not buying a house that's going to be flooding in a couple of years. For the most part, though, flooding is not really something we have to deal with here. The infrastructure is fairly good, especially being a beach town. So it's not something that most people, once you start living here, that most people even have to think about ever again, except for during hurricanes. Which brings us to our next little subtopic of the weather, which is hurricanes. This is probably the biggest question that I get asked all the time is, what are hurricanes like? How devastating is it? Is it really that scary? 
yeah, hurricanes can be a little bit scary, especially if you're not really used to them. Now, I've been a Florida native now since 2015, so call it 20 years. I can't believe it's been that long, almost 20 years now. And hurricanes don't really affect me anymore. I remember the very first one that I went through. I wasn't really sure what was going on. I was active duty military at the time. And they said a hurricane was coming through and they were poising certain people to take our aircraft and leave. And I was not one of them at the time. I just didn't get picked, uh, which is fine. I got to ride out the hurricane right there. And I believe it was like a category one, category two. It wasn't a very big one. And to be honest, it kind of left me a little bit... Um, I don't know. I hate to say wanting more. That's not the right word that I'm looking for, but it definitely left me thinking, man, this should have been a heck of a lot worse. In fact, after the hurricane had mostly passed us, me and a group of friends went out to the Fort Walton Beach Pier and grabbed some beers from a gentleman that was there and went all the way to the end of the pier and watched these waves crash above the pier. If you guys don't know how tall this pier is, it's tall. I don't know how these waves were going up that dang high, but we're young, dumb kids. We're drinking a couple of brewskis and uh, I literally drink one like from four feet away as the, you know, whatever. I was a 22 year old kid or something like that. Don't judge me too much. But the point of this is the hurricane itself wasn't all that big of a deal. And even more so, we had a week in advance notice for this thing. We were watching it on the weather channel, watching its entire movement pattern and looking at the what they call the spaghetti um, the spaghetti weather patterns, I think they're called, where it's like, hey, you know, it might go this way, it might go this way, and it kind of looks like a little bit of spaghetti is going out. But realistically, we've got a ton of time, so if we did need to leave the area, it was easy enough to do. And that's kind of the advice that I give to most people, is just watch the weather. As long as you're not hurtled inside of your house with no TV, you should know exactly what's going on when it comes to the hurricane season. And for the most part, it doesn't do all that much. About once every 20 or 30 years, we get hit pretty big. Like I believe we were hit in uh, late 2004, Hurricane Opal or Ivan. I can't remember which one. Uh, those were the two big ones we've had over the last 50 years. And it did cause damage. That really big one did. But of course, most of the area had already evacuated. So it wasn't all that devastating. It was a little bit to property damage, but that's about it. And of course, with hurricanes, because we all live here, we take care of our neighbors. For those that don't know, one of the other girls that does some of these videos with me, Miss AJ, lived right on the water whenever one of these last hurricanes hit, and it did fill up the basic bottom floor of her home. She's actually on stilts, uh, so it was about three or four feet of water that was completely covering her entire neighborhood, and she did have to evacuate after the fact, basically, during the hurricane, kind of when it was dying out. Um, so that is a little bit scary. Uh, she definitely was a little bit shaken up for a few days, but now, you know, she knows, Hey, you know, when it gets to a certain category size, we're out of here. We're not going to sit here and Florida man it up and try to, uh, try to live through it, I guess. Okay. Let's talk about summer and winter. The two seasons that we have here in Florida. That's it. We don't do that fall or spring thing that a lot of you other guys in the country do, which for some people is a really big con of living in this area because they're like, hey, I like my seasons. I like my seasons. And I'm like, I got you. So do we. We just get rid of the ones we don't like. So for the most part, it's summer and winter. We do have a few cold weeks per year, generally hovering around like the late November time frame. It'll start chilling down pretty good and then start uh, warming back up at around February and March. So like right now, for instance, it's March when I'm shooting this. The weather has been pretty good. I, I'm currently in shorts underneath this and a t-shirt and flippy floppies. And it's the middle of March. Although last week I did have to put on pants for about three days when a cold front came in, but that was about it. I haven't put on a jacket in about a month to give you kind of an example of what the uh, temperatures look like. So for the summertime, you can expect a low of around 74 and a high of around 91, but it is a very humid 91. We have to be very careful about that because some people hear 91 and they think, well, not all that warm. I live in Arizona. I live in Texas. It's 105 over here. Yes. I get it. We also get those extreme temperatures from time to time as well. But our 91 is going to feel pretty close to 98 or 100 degrees. And as soon as you walk outside, the amount of humidity that is in the air is generally going to make you feel instantly a little bit moist. 
In the winter time frame, you can expect a low of around 41 all the way up to around 69 degrees, just depending on which month it is. It does occasionally get below freezing here in Florida, but it is very, very rare. We'll generally only have three or four days a year where it falls underneath that freezing temperature category and goes underneath, 20, or underneath 30 degrees. Okay, okay, hopefully none of that really scared you off. The hurricanes, the flooding, they're, they're just a part of life here in Florida. That's the trade-off that we have to do to have these amazing white sands that we get to go to all the time. But our next topic of conversation is gonna be cost of living because if you're gonna move here to Navarre, you need to make sure that it is going to be affordable for you, whatever your income level is. So keep in mind, I am a real estate agent first, so I was able to look at all of the home prices. That's the biggest expense that we're going to discuss when it comes to cost of living. And this is not an overall cost of living video either. If you'd like to see a full-blown cost of living video where we really break down all of the costs to include housing, insurance, taxes, groceries, um, you know, childcare, all of that. And we really, really break it down and show you guys real life examples of what some of me and some of my agents are paying on a day-to-day -day basis. You can go to our channel and just search uh, up at the top cost of living. You should be able to find one for Navarre. We do one every year and take down the old ones. So you should be able to see that. And if you don't see one at the time, just go to one of the other neighboring cities, Fort Walton Beach or Gulf Breeze, and those are gonna be very, very, very similar. So to give you an overview of this without going too far into it and spending 10 minutes on this topic when you can watch another video on that, let's talk home prices. The median price in Navarre as of last month was $389,000. Now this is for all property, I did not discriminate. So there are condos, there are townhomes and single family homes, there are homes on the water, and there are smaller ranch style 1950s homes in there as well. It's running the gambit of everything, but the median is 389,000. And for that, you can expect to get a three or four bedroom. This is single family homes uh, for this particular section. I did take out the condos. Um, and the townhomes and things like that. So these are detached single family homes in that price range, uh, plus or minus $10,000 is what I did. You can expect a three or four bath home that were split right down the center. There were 22 sold last month. Uh, 11 of them were three bedroom, 11 of them were four bedroom. And you can expect a square footage of around 1,450 square feet, call it 1,500 for easy numbers, all the way up to 2,500 square feet. Obviously, the larger in square feet you go, most likely the less upgraded the home is going to be. But for the most part, the homes in Navarre are not that old. You know, the, a lot of Navarre was built up in the 80s and 90s, all the way up until the 2000s, and a good bulk of them in the 2000s, especially. That's when kind of the Navarre boom was starting to happen. So you are going to get upgraded homes. Some of them might be a little bit outdated as far as like one step back outdated, not like, you know, oak and, you know, little indents on your cabinets, nothing that old, but just kind of one step down uh, from what you're seeing right now. Now, the overall cost of living, if we're putting one big blanket statement over it, according to 24-7 Wall Street, which is one of the uh, reputable places that we look at for average cost of living, they state that a single person living here should expect um, a median livable income to be around $38,000. And this is going to include things like your housing, transportation, taxes, uh, child care, health care, basically all of the big nuggets. I'm sure I missed a couple in that little spiel there, but it's all of the big nuggets that most people would consider when moving to a new area. So there are two more things to talk about with cost of living from you know an overarching standpoint, which is what I'm trying to do here. And that is number one, no state income tax here in Florida. None. We don't do it. And it's awesome. I love it. I hear about other states all the time and some of their outrageous state income taxes they're using to pay for new initiatives and whatever they're using that money for. But here in Florida, we use our tourism as a benefit to us because we've got to deal with tourism. I don't like that because I embrace the tourists. I love I love it. I dislike the traffic, which we'll talk about in a second, but I do love the tourism. And part of that is because they provide us a little bit of benefit because Florida is making enough money through the tourism industry that they don't need to charge a state income tax in order to run the state effectively. And number two is the homestead exemption and all of the homestead opportunities we get. Now, part of this is exciting to me because I'm a real estate agent, but it's all about saving money, really. It is 
basically an exemption that you can get when you homestead your property, meaning you live here full time, you have a primary residence in which you own, They, you can then file for homestead exemption, which would then help you out in your taxes. It's going to reduce the amount of taxes you pay, and it's also going to reduce the amount that the government can raise your property taxes every single year. So you don't have to follow suit. If somebody gets an office and they try to raise property taxes by 7% to get some extra income for some initiatives, anybody that is homesteaded will be capped at 3%. That's right, it keeps your taxes low, which puts more money in your pocket so that you can go to the beach a little bit more often. Now, before we jump into crime and traffic, I do have to say, I, as I said before, I am a real estate agent first. I do run a small team here on the Panhandle. If you are thinking about moving down here or you'd like any extra information on cost of living to include maybe a new list of the prices of homes, you'd like to jump on our list to see our off-market deals and our um, you know, coming soon properties and things like that, stuff you can't find online, just let me know. All of my information will pop up somewhere here on the screen. You can call, you can text, you can email, you can jump on our social media. Whatever is best for you to contact us, we can get you that information that you need. Okay, let's talk about crime. How dangerous is Navarre? Now, Navarre sits right outside of Hurlburt Field, which is an Air Force Special Operations Base. It is also nearby to Eglin Air Force Base and a couple others as well. The point of this is that Generally, um, you're not going to see as much crime around most Air Force bases, and I put an emphasis on the word most for a reason, because there are some, as we all know, a lot of military bases are planted in the bad part of town because it's the cheapest land for them to buy. But with Anglin or Hurlburt, it is a little bit different. They strategically did that for the amount of land that they have uh, an opportunity to use that's not inside of populated areas. So depending on which website you listen to, the crime is all over the place, but all relatively the same. So I use neighborhoodscout.com for this information I'm about to give you. The overall crime in Navarre is around eight people per thousand are going to experience some sort of crime. And that is right on par with the national average. It might be slightly one tick below average as well. Whereas violent crime, which is the one I would be more worried about, is actually one out of every about 1,300 people, which is far less than the national average. And just to be completely open and transparent, I did go to another website and see what they had as well. So you've got kind of two options to look at. And this one is called uh, crimegrade.org, crimegrade.org. And this one actually said the crime was even better. It gave Navarre an A-plus rating. I don't know about you, but in, when I went to school, A-plus was as high as you could get. They said it was in the 94th percentile, which means that 94% of the cities and towns in this country have worse crime than Navarre does. So both of these lead me to believe that Navarre is a very crime-free area. And I say it this way for a reason. I am a licensed real estate agent, so I'm not allowed to talk about crime from a personal level. So I try to limit my opinions and just try to use what I can gather online. But everything that I'm telling you right now is exactly my experience that I notice when it comes to crime in Navarre. Okay, let's talk about one of the elephants in the room. One of the things that us locals don't like that much. Our next topic is traffic. Yeah, we have traffic. Sometimes we have a lot of traffic. In fact, I am located in Fort Walton Beach here in my office, whereas my house is in Mary Esther slash East Navarre. They're kind of one and the same. Technically, Mary Esther is part of Fort Walton, but I'm on the other side of Hurlburt Field for those that know the area, so I kind of consider it East Navarre. Here's my point. The traffic can sometimes suck going that direction. So when I'm headed west from Fort Walton Beach, there is a lot of traffic that comes out of Hurlburt Field when they are releasing for the day, which they generally release around 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. And it's all over the place. Some of them are leaving early at 3 p.m. Some of them are leaving late at 5.30. The normal duty day when I was active at Hurlburt Field, because that's where I was stationed, uh, one of the two bases in the area that I was stationed at, because I was also at Eglin. But the duty day was 7.30 in the morning until 4.30 in the afternoon. Now, going to the office, so heading east from where I live to here, crossing over Hurlburt, 
the traffic's not bad. It's very rarely slows anything down. Everything's going at least the speed limit, if not more. I'm not 100% sure why when they get out um, that there's traffic there, but not when they're going into the office. And maybe that's because I'm missing a lot of it because I don't uh, start headed to the office till 8, 8.30 in the morning, where a lot of military members might start their travel at 7 or 7.30 in the morning or even earlier to make sure that they're there by 7.30. But my point is from 3 to 6 p.m., if you were headed on the Destin or Fort Walton Beach side and headed west back into Navarre, from 3 to 6 p.m., most of the time, it's not fun to do. Now, it's not devastating either. It generally takes me 15 minutes to get home, 14 on a good day if I'm a little extra speedy. It takes me 14 minutes to get home, whereas on heavy traffic days, it will take me 25. This is not a huge jump. But we're so used to it not being like that here in this area because we're not over in the Destin, Florida area where there's a lot more traffic that when this traffic does hit, us locals don't like it and we're going to voice it as well. So you'll hear talk about how bad the traffic is pretty regularly. But all in all, compared to bigger cities or even like slightly bigger cities like Pensacola or Panama City, the traffic is not near as bad as anything like that and definitely nowhere near the big cities like Los Angeles, Huntington Beach, Chicago, New York, etc, etc. There is one other time to consider some of the traffic and that is during tourist season, particularly during spring break. So most people have one to two weeks of spring break. Our area kind of has six weeks. This was explained to me by a cab driver way back in the day when cabs were a thing before Uber. And here's how it was explained to me, which seems to be spot freaking on. And that is that all of the colleges in our area, for the ones that do vacation down here and the college kids come out, they go in two-week cycles and they're all over the place. So this one comes out during two weeks, you know, at this certain time, and this one's the next two weeks, and this one's the next two weeks. And that's kind of how it goes. So we feel like we have six weeks of spring break here, whereas we might only be celebrating two. We've got to deal with the traffic of six. Now, does this traffic absolutely devastate us and ruin our day or anything like that? No, it is noticeable, but it is not so noticeable that this has turned into how Destin is. Destin, you could be sitting in traffic for an hour. It does happen from time to time, although even that's not generally the norm. In the Navarre area, you can expect to sit in traffic, but I have absolutely never in almost 20 years been sitting in traffic in Navarre for over an hour, even when there was an accident on Highway 98, which is the main thoroughfare that goes east to west, west to east through Navarre. All right, before I jump into the last two topics that you do not want to miss, I just want to thank you if you've made it this far. If you're a returning subscriber, really, really thank you. That's awesome that you guys have been hanging on. I love seeing your guys' comments down below, by the way. I'm starting to like recognize certain names and stuff. So if you guys are one to like to comment, please do that. That's always awesome. And if you are finding us for the very first time, also, thank you. That's really cool. I'm hoping you're getting some sort of value out of this. Feel free to hit that subscribe button if you are and continue to get uh, more videos like this. So next up, we just talked about traffic, so it would be rude not to talk about tourism. We already talked about how tourism benefits us with the no state income tax, but there are a few more things to discuss with the tourism side that we need to make sure we touch on. So the first thing I want to talk about with this is my little theory. Okay, we're just going to call this a theory. We're not going to, this isn't fact. This is just purely conjecture on my side. I've been saying it for about four or five years now. I have this strange suspicion that Navarre is slowly turning into the next Destin. So previously, Navarre was known as the Emerald Coast best kept secret or the best kept secret of Florida. However, I forgot exactly what our sign said. They took them down about a year ago and they they raised them up to something else. I don't remember what the slogan now of Navarre is. But that's exactly what Navarre used to be when I first moved here. In fact, when I first, first moved here in 2005, six, whatever time frame that was, Navarre was really a secret. Like there were, there were a lot of people living there, but when you drove through, it didn't feel like it. And now it, it does. It does feel like there's a lot of people living there. You can tell with the traffic on 98. You can tell with how many cars are on the road, how many people are out of the beach. And it has most definitely grown. And I have this sneaking suspicion that because Destin has been tapped out on land for as far as I can remember, and Navarre still has a lot of available land to build on. It's one of the few areas in the scope in which we touch that still has a lot of land outside of Crestview, Milton, Baker, Defuniac Springs, Freeport, like those ones that are further north that are away from the water down here. 
Outside of those, Navarre is really the one with the most amount of land to build on. And because of that, people are seeing an opportunity to come here and build. And this is exactly why I think it might be slowly turning into sort of Destin. I don't think it'll ever be like Destin is on a pure like tourism level, but I think it's leaning that direction. And you can tell even in their home prices. So not three, four years ago when this channel first, first started, Navarre was one of the cheaper places to live. In fact, there was once upon a time when I first got into real estate almost a decade ago, Navarre and Crestview, which Crestview is way far off of Navarre. It's very far north. It's 45 minutes to the beach. So prices are obviously going to be lower. But once upon a time, the prices were very com um, comparable. In fact, when I first got into real estate, people would ask me about these two. And I would say, well, Navarre's closer to the beach. Crestview isn't. You're getting the same house, the same buck, and you're maybe spending 20, 30 grand more over in Navarre than you are in Crestview. That is no longer the case. Navarre has definitely raised its prices. The days of $200,000 homes really aren't that prevalent here in Navarre, although it is possible it doesn't happen very often. That can still happen up in Crestview. Again, not as common, but it still does. My point here is the prices have risen and it's starting to look like that's going to continue to trend, which is great for anybody that gets in over the next five years because our property values are increasing faster than the other cities in our area. That's super important to note. That is showing that there is some demand there that is above and beyond some of the other areas. And because they've got the ability to fulfill that demand, it is driving prices up. So it's typical supply and demand curve right there. People want to live near the beach and they want to do it for an inexpensive price. Navarre is a great place to go to do that. I mean, heck, we just gave you the median home price of $389,000 here in Navarre, whereas over in Destin, I think it's somewhere close to like five hundred fifty, six hundred, or something like that. Don't quote me on that. I don't have the numbers right in front of me right now, but you get my point. It is considerably cheaper to live, which is a bonus, but you know, down the road in 10 years, is it going to look a little bit different? Is it going to be the, you know, nice, quiet, sleepy town of Navarre? I don't know. I think it'll always keep a little bit of that charm though. Now, that being said, Navarre is still pretty low in tourism. There is a very specific type of person that likes to visit Navarre over Destin, over Fort Walton 30A, Pensacola, Panama City. There's a very specific avatar, and that's somebody that likes that more laid back lifestyle. They, they want to go to a place with beautiful beaches that have great tourist attractions and amazing restaurants and places to go have a drink at, and just enjoy their time, but they don't want to do it in a hustling, bustling sort of feel like Destin. They want to be able to drive there and enjoy it if they want, but they want their overall experience to be a little bit more laxed, and I can't blame them. So tourism here in Navarre is highest from April to September, and there are little moments here and there that are going to be more busy than others, like 4th of July weekend, any weekend that's a three-day weekend because anybody within a few hours drive could just drive down here, rent an Airbnb, and enjoy the weekend. And then, of course, as I mentioned already, spring break. Now, for the tourists that like water activities, you're generally going to see a larger percentage of them out of the water um, around the April to May time frame and then the September to November time frame, where temperatures are generally around the 65 degrees all the way up to about 80 degrees. So that is kind of our cooler months, if you will. All right, that was a lot of talk about tourism. So let's go into a topic that we get all too often, that is schools. Now, I don't have any school-aged children, so this is something that I've got to rely on my other agents here that work in my office with me. Um, I've got to rely on their children. We've got a lot of kids on this team uh, from my real estate agents and their kids and stuff. So I do have a pretty good insight there. And then also looking online to see what the schools rank for is very important because if you are going to be moving down here, this is a little bit different than just coming down here as a tourist or temporarily visiting family or whatever you might have done in Navarre in the past. If you have, you're going to be moving down here with your family. For those that have kids, this part's going to be super important. So niche.com, which is one of the reputable sites that we use, ranks every single school in Navarre at at least a B or better from an A, B, C, D, F rating there at least a B, with three of them being A's and A minuses. Now, the top three schools that have the highest rating based on their math and reading proficiency are, and I've got to read them, so let me look down here for a second. We've got Holly Navarre Intermediate, West Navarre Intermediate, and Holly Navarre Middle School. The schools in Navarre also have an average rating of 9 out of 10, with them being considered in the top 20% of all of Florida. That is a lot of schools and so many of them being right here in Navarre. In fact, if you've been watching this channel for a long time, you have heard us rant and rave and, well, I guess not really ranting, but raving about the schools in Niceville. 
for so many years. Well, over the past year to two years, Navarre has been creeping up on the ratings and I think even now are comparable, if not a little bit better than Niceville. This is a great turn of events because Niceville is extremely expensive in comparison. The same four bed, you know, 2,500 square foot that you can get down here for 390,000 is gonna cost you upwards of 700K in Niceville. So another great opportunity for people with families to come down here and still get great schools without having to reduce their lifestyle by buying a house a little bit outside of what maybe they want to. And for those curious on the different things that the schools do, I know they're very big into sports there in Navarre. In fact, uh, one of our agents has three of her kids, I think, in volleyball. Uh, they've tried lacrosse. They've tried a bunch of different sports, and they offer these kind of things. They also go to great school field trips like museums, the zoo recently, the um, wildlife habitat preservation or the turtle conservation center, things like that. So the field trips and everything that they go on is pretty good and their sports scene is seems to be pretty solid as well. That's all of the information I have on schools. I hope this video was helpful to you. If there was something that you feel like I should have covered, maybe didn't, or just a general inquiry that you have, you can always reach out to me with all of the information on the screen, or of course, you can comment down below. It is one of my favorite things when my phone dings and it says new comment on YouTube, I get excited, even when the trolls do it. Like even then I'm like, cool, you know, it's an opportunity to have an engagement with somebody. I really, really like it. So don't hesitate to comment down below. And if you guys need any extra information on Navarre or any of the areas that we cover here on the Florida Panhandle, you know exactly how to get a hold of me. I'll see you guys next week.